Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for everything that you are doing in our midst. I pray that you would help us as we uh, continue to plow through Genesis. I ask that you would uh, help us to understand the uh, things that you uh, find needful for us to know at this time in our life. I pray that you would uh, give us your spirit of wisdom and revelation, reveal yourself to us. And uh, help us as we work through this. Uh, even when we look at names and uh, look at passages that we don't understand very well, I just pray that you would give us understanding. So help us today, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Okay, we are going to try to get into uh, somewhere in chapter 10. Uh, there is a new handout today over there. Uh, if you didn't get the one from last week, Genesis 9 is there. The one for this week is Genesis 10. And I'm just going to recap what we looked at in chapter 9 briefly with the covenants. Uh, remind you again, so far we've seen three different covenants. We've seen the Edenic covenants, the first contract, which was a conditional covenant that God made. Um, and that didn't work because... Uh, man couldn't keep his end of the bargain. And we had the Adamic covenant, which is still uh, in effect today. Uh, the effects of sin, the warnings, the curses, uh, and uh, blessings as well. And then we have uh, Noah's covenant, which was the third contract. And I just want to pull out a few things that I briefly mentioned last time, but I want to show you the scripture that go along with it. Um, so again, he's told to repopulate the earth, but not to subdue it. So that's different from the Edenic covenant. Uh, the fear of man is put into animals. Man was to dominate them. Man's diet included animals, but forbidden to eat blood. And in this covenant here, um, there are some key points relating to salvation that we need to understand. And the first one here is really about this forbidden to eat blood. And I want to take you briefly to Leviticus chapter 17. Uh, verses 11 through 14. So Leviticus, the third book in the Bible, chapter 17, verses 11 through 14. Here's the explanation that God gives to Moses as he establishes the law uh, for the nation of Israel. Uh, verse 11, chapter 17. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. So the blood carries the life. That is God's definition of the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. So all the way back in the desert, as Israel is wandering through, um, uh, through the desert, God is already instilling the need for a blood sacrifice that is going to come to cover everybody's sins, which we know is Jesus Christ. Verse 12, Therefore I said to the children of Israel, No one among you shall eat blood, nor shall any stranger who sojourns among you eat blood. And whatever man of the children of Israel, or of the strangers who sojourn among you, who hunts and catches any animal or bird that may be eaten, he shall pour out its blood and cover it with dust. For it is the life of all flesh, its blood, sustains its life. It's interesting, I'm not sure if I've mentioned this before, but um, uh, what is the symbol for barber shops today? At them. And what uh, colors are on them? White. Anybody know what the history of that is? They used to be a first aid station. They used to be a bloodletting station. Uh, hundreds of years ago, it was practice to if you had a sickness or disease, to have your blood let. People thought if you let the blood drain out, uh, you will the sickness will leave with the blood that is being drained out. In fact, the uh, Quincy Museum, when they had that uh, historic exhibit of all the, the Civil War things, they had bloodletting tools in there. I don't know if anybody saw that exhibit. But the interesting thing is, the Bible says clearly what the blood does, it carries life. If you let it out, you'll die, right? Uh, in fact, that's how George Washington died. Do you know that? He died because his blood was being let out. Um, leeches. 
they they were yeah they were bloodletting his his stuff. So I thought it was the false teeth. There was some. Okay. So anyway, um, uh, the life of all flesh, its blood sustains its life. So that's the, a key principle for understanding what God does with Jesus. He is the one who covers our sin. God has ordained blood to cover sin. But if you don't have Jesus, you have to every sin atone for with animal sacrifices. And that system has been completed in Jesus. Jesus fulfilled the law. He didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. So um, then we also have capital punishment. All murderers will be executed. A promise that God would never send the global flood again. Sign of the covenant was the rainbow. So uh, that to finish out that section. Now we're going to go into the remainder part of chapter 9 just briefly before we hit uh, chapter 10. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. This is very important to understand. Uh, who wrote... Genesis, obviously the Holy Spirit, but who did the Holy Spirit inspire to write Genesis? Moses. Moses, okay. This is a very important point that Moses writes about Canaan, and this is going to come up in the next few verses. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. So again, we've had in this, just in this chapter alone numerous times where it has made the point there was nobody else alive. Everybody had died and the earth is going to be repopulated from mm -hmm. Noah's family. Uh, Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Um, it is assumed that he was probably a farmer before he was told to build the ark, because uh, he had 600 years before the ark came into the picture. So most likely he was a farmer before, so he became a farmer again. But understand, there are new dynamics now because the world is completely different, right? So we have uh, him essentially beginning to be a farmer because he has to learn again how to interact with uh, the new creation here, essentially, because no longer is everything watered by the mist. Now it's watered through rain, and, and people have to start creating irrigation systems and different things like that. So it's a completely new dynamic. So even though he probably was a farmer before, he has to relearn how to do everything. And he's 600-something uh, years old. <laughs> so uh, you're never too old to learn something new. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk. Now, there's a lot of different commentators that talk about this. And, and some of them say this is the evidence uh, that sin is still very present. Uh, you can totally take that line. Another uh, areas of commentators said he had never experienced that type of, of vineyard, and so he became drunk for the first time unknowingly. Whatever it is doesn't really matter. He gets drunk. Okay? He gets drunk. He becomes uncovered in his tent, which means he's naked. And Ham, the father of Canaan, remember the second time that he's making this point, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness, of his father and told his two brothers outside. Now what takes place here is a heart problem, a, a condition of the heart. He goes into the tent, he sees his father's nakedness, and he goes and makes fun of it. He tells his brothers. Um, what his brothers do is drastically different. It shows a different heart. Okay? Mm -hmm. Shem and Japheth, they took a garment laid it on both their shoulders and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away and they did not see their father's nakedness. So there is a very clear understanding in this family that it is wrong to look upon the nakedness of your relatives, so particularly of the father in this case. So Shem and Japheth, they do the right thing. They go in backwards, they don't look, they cover him up with a blanket. Um, Ham, on the other hand, some people say this was a homosexual act. Some people talk about he had Canaan with him because of the curse that comes next. We don't know. It's not told to us exactly in Scripture. But we do know that it was a wrong attitude, a wrong heart that Ham had. And uh, he should not have... Uh, it, I mean, obviously, you walk in, you see the nakedness. There's nothing you can do. You just saw it. But the, what he did with that information was wrong. And he went and basically made fun of his father. 
there's a respect issue, honoring your father and mother that is, is an issue here. So there is a response from Noah that comes. Do you have a question? Well, I thought that you were not told to be naked if they should cover it. Uh, that is not the implication in the text. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him, and here's why. Okay, uh, it was there was an uh, th there was a, a problem here. It wasn't if if he had just walked in and went to tell his brothers to go cover him, he could have covered him himself, right? He he didn't have to go and follow other people. Um, but there's a problem here because Noah awoke and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, and this is Noah now speaking prophetically about the nations that are going to come from his three sons. And he talks about Canaan first. Then he said, cursed be Canaan. A servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. Now it's interesting the name Canaan means to be brought down, to be made low. It is the low land. Okay? So he, Canaan, and his descendants are cursed by Noah here through a prophetic spirit of, of the Holy Spirit that there is going to be something that is going to take place in the lineage of Canaan that is causing them to be servants uh, causing them to be uh, servants specifically to his brethren. Now, uh, when the Israelites went into the promised land, who was living there? Canaanites. The Canaanites. What were they told to do to the Canaanites? No. Utterly destroy. Utterly destroy them. It goes back to this point here. The history from this point on, the choice that Ham made, and Canaan was somehow involved here, obviously, because of the curse being uh, specifically through the line of Canaan, because Ham had more children. Okay, So Canaan is involved here somehow, but he has uh, a, a curse placed on him. He's going to be a servant of servants. He, um, Moses is, is teaching the Israelites as they are in the wilderness waiting to enter into the promised land. God has already ordained for us to have their space. They are a cursed people. And God is going to remove them with whatever means he chooses to do. And he chose to use the Israelite armies to do that. Now, the Israelites were not obedient, so not all of Canaan was, um, was destroyed. There were some children of Canaan that survived, um, and they became servants to the Israelite people. And at different times, God used them to judge the Israelite nation. Um, so there, there's a lot of dynamics that happen here, but it goes back to this point here where there was a, a major event that we quickly read over, but a major event that takes place here that causes Noah to speak prophetically about Canaan uh, and about uh, what's going to happen to his descendants. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So there is a blessing spoken on the, the lineage of Shem. Uh, who comes through Shem? The reason we are here is Jesus. <laughs> okay. All these cheat sheets. <laughs> Why am I wasting my time? Okay. So the Israelites come through Shem, right? And essentially Jesus. Okay. And then we have um, uh, Canaan being the servant of Shem. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. I think this is also inter interesting here, because Japheth really represents um, what we would consider to be the Gentile nations. Um, and so we have an enlargement that takes place. The, it's also a prophetic destiny for the Gentiles to be grafted in to the, the Israelite Heritage, right? So we are dwelling in the tents of Shem, Shem essentially, spiritually. Hmm. May Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. So all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So um, 
still a long life after the flood, he still was actively involved in restructuring how life was going to take place from now on. Um, so you have uh, three sons, one of them who, however soon it happens, starts leading his nations that come from him on a wrong path, and two that eventually start being more and more corrupt as well. But um, it's, we can actively see how sin is still uh, a big problem for the human race, even after uh, only eight people were alive. So, chapter 10, a few minutes for this. Now, is the, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. The sons of Japheth were Gomer, Magog, Madai, Javan, Tubal, Meshech, and Tiras. Now, in your handout, you have two tables of nations, one from uh, the historian called Josephus. A lot of you have probably heard of him. Uh, he was a, uh, a secular Jew who uh, was taken to Rome eventually. He, he was actually uh, a leader in Jerusalem, but uh, he was then taken captive by the Romans. And the Romans actually commissioned him to make a history of the Jews, to write it down for, um, for generations to come, because the Romans were having a lot of problems with the Jewish nation, and uh, they wanted to have a, an accurate history of what is going on with that nation. So he came up with, um, based off of this chapter 10 of Genesis, a table of nations, which he actually researched through Jewish um, history, through uh, Jewish writings that were outside of the Bible. So it's amazing to parallel what he researched with the second table, which is what the Bible actually teaches. It's remarkably similar, him going through secular sources to find out that what the Bible said in chapter 10 is very true. So um, you can compare that. I know it's a little hard to read um, the Josephus table. It's the best I could find um, uh, for printing for us. But if you do want to study this in more detail, uh, there are a lot of um, uh, free online books um, with Josephus' writings where he explains uh, more of this, this type of stuff. And the third thing that you have is kind of a uh, name list with whose descendants they were, the people that came from there, and uh, where we find uh, references for that in the rest of scripture. But I just want to briefly talk to you from a few people in this chapter to give you kind of an idea of what area of the world they populated. So we have here the uh, sons of Japheth. We have Gomer. Uh, he was uh, the father of Germanic peoples. So you have uh, most of the original people from Western Europe would come under Gomer. There's also Ashkenaz, which comes uh, as a son of Gomer. Ashkenaz, the Hebrew word for Germany is Ashkenaz. So there's, there's a lot of things that, uh, uh, that we still can see today um, in reference to these ancestors. Magog, Tubal, and Meshech, they are actually the Russian uh, people. In fact, Meshech, the original name of Moscow was Meshech. Hmm. So we have, again, a direct relation here. Madai, uh, he is the father of the Medes. And we, we know of the Medes and the Persians. So Madai was specifically the Medes people. Uh, people more towards India. Uh, we have Javan, who is the father of the ancient Greeks. So you can see from these guys came nations, and they. Uh, what the story that comes next is the Tower of Babel, and the Tower of Babel is going to divide people into people groups, and they're going to be according to their families. So we, we will see people groups being sent out to different areas. And, and we'll talk about why God did this uh, when we, uh, hopefully next week we'll be able to just get in there. So I, I don't think I'm going to give you all of chapter 10 
um, in its entirety because you can do research if you're interested in the meanings of names and, and all that. You can do that on your own. I, I hope I've given you enough tools to do that. One guy that I want to pick out in chapter 10, um, and I think he comes around verse 7. There it is, 8. Uh, Kush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, when you just read this, it doesn't sound bad, does it? It sounds, well, he's a mighty hunter before the Lord, and you're thinking he's hunting animals. He's not. He is a mighty hunter under the gaze of the Lord, trying to be his own person, hunting people. He is a dictator. He is someone who is uh, setting himself up to lead the people by oppression. See, he's, he's a tyrant. That's what this, this guy Nimrod is, okay? Um, he was a mighty one on the earth, but not in a good way. He ruled, uh, actually, take a, take a wild guess as to which nations he established and which cities. Ever heard of? Nineveh. Yes, Nineveh. What do we know about Nineveh? Very naughty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, that's an understatement. <laughs> the Ninevites and the people of Assyria, they were known as the most vile people. They were the, the worst uh, army to have attack you because they would literally dismember everybody. They, they were a horrible people. Um, we also have Babylon also goes on this guy's register, right? He started these cities. So you can scour the scriptures for information on what Babylon stands for, right? So this is not a good guy. He ruled over Babel, which was the first organized rebellion of humans against God. And the name Nimrod, guess what it means? Let us rebel. <laughs> Rebellion. That is what his name means. So um, when they said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, the context shows that this is not a compliment. Okay? This is a, uh, an offense before the face of God. So that's where we're going to end, because Nimrod takes us right into chapter 11 for, for next week, and we will start looking at the Tower of Babel and the events pertaining to that. Oh, one other guy in chapter 10 that we will mention again next week is at the very end it talks about Peleg. Um, find in your text Peleg and tell me what it says. Now or next week? No, now. Because <laughs> that way I make sure that you're reading it. Verse 17. Verse 17, what does it say? After he begot Peleg, he lived 430 years and begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and begot Ruth. After he begot Ruth, Peleg lived 209 years and begot sons and daughters. Is there more to this? Should be. Yeah, it's uh, verse 25. It says, In his days the earth was divided. Which event? Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel, right? So Peleg, we know in the history and the lineage of what happens, the years that it takes to get to the Tower of Babel, Peleg is the guy when the earth is divided, when God sends that judgment of bringing in languages to divide the people. So uh, let's pray.